Thanks for downloading the Cross Defense Podcast. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, and we start a new series today, The Last Days of Jesus. We'll talk about the history of Jesus, starting with Monday, Thursday, going all the way to his crucifixion, death, and burial uh, through the season of Lent. So we start that today. We talk about the washing of the disciples' feet, the giving of the body, and the blood, and the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and what that means for us, for our life, for our peace, for our death for our resurrection, for our hope. Well, hope you enjoy it. Here's, here's the show. Hey, hey, welcome to Cross Defense. Sorry for that little delay. Apparently they got a fire alarm there in St. Louis. Everything's well here in Austin, Texas, in the Tower Studio. Your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church and Jesus Death Lutheran Church here in Austin, Texas. Come and visit when you're here. Welcome, by the way, everybody, to Lent. That is the season of the church here in which we are. And I, it, just, it occurred to me, we're going to be here at St. Paul Lutheran Church. Whoa. We're going to be working through the, um, the, the passion of Jesus, the last few days of Jesus in our Lent services. And uh, I thought that's a nice idea for our time together here on Cross Defense. So I think that's what we do. I mean, after all, what we're doing here on Cross Defense is trying to fight back against the temptation to theological boredom by rejoicing together in the Lord's Word. And some of the most precious words of the Holy Scriptures are the words of our Lord Jesus and especially the words describing his suffering uh, and his death for us. So that's what we're going to do, I think. And, and you know, another advantage, by the way, of this whole uh, plot is it. I don't have to think of something new every week. We'll just do this for the next six weeks, walk through the passion of Jesus together, uh, meditate on it, and, and rejoice in it. So so here we go. Now, to set the stage, we're talking about the, um, well, we're talking about the last three days of the life of Jesus. So we'll start on Monday, Thursday. And work through Good Friday and until we get to the to the burial of Jesus on the evening of Good Friday. And perhaps even uh, we'll take up uh, his resurrection after Easter. That'd be nice. But we want to remember that Holy Week is um, qu- quite uh, full and, and packed. Uh, Jesus was staying, in, in fact, it seems like the whole time during Holy Week, Jesus was staying in Bethany which remembers on the other side of the Mount of Olives. So if you, if you can, let me try to paint this picture for you. Uh, if you haven't been to Jerusalem, it's, it's, quite, it's quite wonderful, and you can see these things, and you can imagine it. That's the only way I could possibly imagine it, is having seen it. But, so, but some of you probably have better imaginations than me, so let's see if we can, if we can describe it. Um, Mount Jerusalem, especially ancient Jerusalem, but even still old ancient Jerusalem, is on uh, the Mount Zion. And Mount Zion kind of comes as a it's like a, a sort of a ridge that drops off and so you think of it like a prow of a of a ship and and there on the top of this uh, hill really is the city of Jerusalem and it's surrounded by walls and then houses all around it if you go north and west you get into kind of the suburbs and if but right in the middle there's a wall and there's a temple that's on the on the north uh, uh, on the northeast side of the city and then if you come down from the temple, so imagine the temple there kind of on the northeast side, and, as you, and the right, uh, right east of the temple, you drop down into a valley, and that's the Kidron Valley. And it runs down, from, from, it runs north to south along the east side of, of Mount Zion. And then when you come up out of that valley on the other side, you come up a, a steeper and a little bit bigger hill, which is the Mount of Olives. So if you're on the top of the Mount of Olives, you're looking down on Mount Zion. You're looking down on Jerusalem, and you can see it there. And if you kept going over the Mount of Olives, if you continued east over the Mount of Olives, you would come to the little village of Bethany. And Bethany is where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. In fact, Jesus was down probably by the Jordan River when they heard that Lazarus was had died. Jesus gets the news that Lazarus has died. He says, "We got to go now to Jerusalem, or do we got to go to Bethany, so that I can raise Lazarus from the dead?" And um, and he and and they go and they say, "Well, we don't want to go there because that they they're trying to kill you because Bethany was so close to uh, to Jerusalem that all the opponents of Jesus could 
probably find him. But the fact that Jesus stays in Bethany all through Holy Week accounts for the the difficulty that the Pharisees are having in finding Jesus. So Jesus enters, you got to think about it this way, when, when Jesus enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he travels from Bethany over the Mount of Olives down the road there, which is called the the Triumphal Entry Road. It wasn't called that then. <laughs> but he goes down the Mount of Olives, through the Kidron Valley, and up into the city of Jerusalem. Then he leaves, and he goes back to Bethany. Then on Holy Monday, Jesus goes back over the Mount of Olives, back down through the Kidron Valley. He passes the fig tree that he cursed the day. Uh, he curses the fig tree on that Monday. He goes back in Jerusalem. Then he leaves, back in Bethany on Monday night. Then on Tuesday, Holy Tuesday, Jesus goes back from Bethany, back into Jerusalem. That's the last day of his public teaching in the temple in Jerusalem, Holy Tuesday, where he gets in these fights with the scribes and the Pharisees and everyone else like this. And so, and so that's happening on Holy Tuesday. And, uh, uh, and and that argument happens, you know, whose wedding marriage will the woman be in the resurrection, and should we pay taxes to Caesar and all this other stuff, and then back into Bethany, per, presumably for for the whole day on Holy Wednesday, maybe Holy Wednesday. We don't know what happened on Holy Wednesday, but maybe Holy Wednesday is the day that Judas left Bethany and 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 Mary and Martha and Lazarus's house and went into Jerusalem to make the contract for the thirty pieces of silver. That probably happened that day. But then we get to we get to Holy Thursday or Monday Thursday, and Jesus sends the disciples back into Jerusalem so they can go and eat the Passover meal. And it's really quite stunning that almost like it, 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 there's all these parallels between Palm Sunday and Monday Thursday in the preparations. So Jesus says, go into the village opposite us and you'll find a donkey tied and grab a hold of it, tell the man we need it, and so forth. The same thing happens on Monday, Thursday. They say, well, what, where do you want to eat the Passover? And Jesus says, well, go and you'll find a man and he has an upper room and it's prepared. And so they went and they found it just like Jesus said. Now, uh, I want to pick up the story there. Now, there's a lot that happens on Monday, Thursday. And especially in the Gospel of John, uh, we, John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, five of those chapters unfold the teaching of Jesus on Monday, Thursday. And this should not be neglected, but for the sake of our conversation here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of lightly touch on a couple of the things that Jesus said. I'm not going to dig into all of it. But I want to start in John chapter 13 with this amazing event of the washing of the disciples' feet. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that, it, that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garment and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This is absolutely stunning. I mean, hard to even imagine this. I read somewhere that, that washing feet was such a lowly job that even disciples were not expected or could even be asked to wash the feet of their masters. So, you know, in the, in the ancient world, the, the discipleship culture was such that if you, if you were a rabbi and you had disciples, they were, ba they were basically like your servants they would do your bidding and so forth but but there were some jobs that were so menial that even a disciple wouldn't do that belonged only to the servants and washing feet was one of them i mean it was a a lowly job only a servant or a slave would do it but can you imagine i mean nobody had washed their feet they traveled to this place. There was maybe no servants available or for whatever reason, maybe it was a humble home or something like that. And so, so no one's there to wash the, wash their feet. And so they go into the room and everything's prepared and Jesus stands up from the table and you have to think, what, what's he going to do? 
Remember, that's always, by the way, what we want to be asking when we're reading the Scripture. What's, what's going to come next? We try to guess because it's nice because what comes next is never what we guess. And so it lets us, it lets us see the gap between our expectations and the truth of the Scripture. That's important, actually, a technique for reading the Scripture. And so Jesus is now, he's been talking about dying, he's been talking about suffering, but he's had his royal entry, and it seems like the crowds are mostly on his side in fact the pharisees you remember the disciples were afraid to be in jerusalem because they were they were sure that jesus was going to be arrested and killed and yet the pharisees have been unable to arrest them they've been unable to stop them their arguments have fallen short they the 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 pharisees themselves want to capture jesus in uh in private because they're also afraid because the crowds are on his side in fact we got to we got to remember that jesus seems like he's winning the crowds such that when it comes to it on on the next morning, when it goes to the crowd, Pilate thinks that he can float the 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 release of Jesus. What's that called? Someone off the hook? Uh, when you commute their sentence, Pilate thinks he can float the commuting of the sentence, and the crowds will ask for him. So there's a moment there. It's like right on the th- which way are the crowds going to go? But it seems like up to this point, the crowds are on Jesus' side, and so the disciples have to be thinking, well, maybe we were wrong. Maybe the people aren't in the pockets of the Pharisees. Maybe he is going to ride into this place as king. After all, he did it, and he was try. He overthrew the. He he turned over the tables in the temple. He rode in on the donkey, and everyone was praising him. Maybe it's not going to be as bad as we think. So the they're looking at this as this coronation, and and then Jesus stands up. And he takes off his outer robe, and he takes a towel and wraps it around himself, and a bowl full of water, and he goes now and he kneels down on his hands and his knees, and he starts washing their feet. And we know that Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. We know that Jesus comes in humility, but this is such a profound example of it. Ivan, who's watching on live on YouTube now, asks, why was washing the disciples' feet such a lowly task? Well, number one, it was disgusting. And number two, it was also cultural. So the, the, this idea of kneeling down and and wipe it's one of the ways that for example Mary Magdalene if it was Mary Magdalene I think it was when she's washing the feet of Jesus with her tears and wiping his his feet with her with her hair it's such a, a, a exercise of profound humility and love so Jesus is washing their feet and you have to imagine that they're looking on this with stunned faces and what they're all probably thinking comes out when Jesus comes to Peter. There's an image somewhere, a painting of, of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And in it, Peter has his hand in his head. There, I've seen two of them. And one I've been able to find, the other one I can't. And, and Peter is just covering his face in shame as Jesus is there kneeling to, to, to wash his feet. Here's how it goes. He came, Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who would betray him, that is why he said, Not all of you are clean. Wow! Now Peter, and it's good to reflect on this a little bit, that Peter reacts in two different directions. Both of them wrong, both of them dangerous, one of pride, one of despair. First he says, Lord, no, no, I, I, I'm not worthy. I should be washing your feet. Like John the Baptist, remember when Jesus goes to be baptized and John said, you should baptize me. Peter realizes, look, if anybody's going to be washing anybody's feet, I, Lord, should be washing your feet. You shouldn't be washing mine. You're the Lord. I'm the disciple. You're the master. 
And yet Jesus says to him, it has to be so. If, you, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. I am the one who comes to serve. This is really quite incredible. Remember, in just a few minutes, Jesus is going to ask the disciples and say, what? Well, uh, He's going to say, who's greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who, who sits at the table? And yet I am among you as the one who serves. Or remember how Jesus taught in the Gospel of Mark. He says, the Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as, an exa as, a, as a ransom for many. So did, Jesus didn't come to be served, and he still doesn't come to be served. He says to Peter, it is necessary that I come to you and I serve you. But then Peter goes the other way, and he says, well, if you're going to serve me, serve me this way. Now, there's, we can, I mean, maybe we don't want to take it easy on Peter, because we can understand, he, when, when Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me, then, then Peter says, well, then wash away, because I want to be part of you. And yet, the Lord is saying, Peter, you, just because I'm serving you doesn't mean you can tell me how to do it. <laughs> Jesus, let, let's say it like this, Jesus is the master who serves so it's a surprise that he serves us, and yet he is the one who decides how to serve us. Just because Jesus says, I'm going to serve you, doesn't mean that we get to say, okay, well, serve me this way. <laughs> Give me these things. Here's what I want. <laughs> Ser serve me in the way that I want to be served. No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Jesus will serve, <laughs> Jesus will serve according, to, according to his good will and good pleasure. Well, he washes the feet, and he stands up, and then he's going to teach them. And we'll pick that up on the other side of the break. We've got to take a quick break here, and we'll be right back talking about the, the, the last days of Jesus, uh, what he did, what he said, and how it's all for us. You're listening to Cross the Fence. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi folks, this is Matt Harrison, President of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Join us for the March on the Arch, Saturday, March 7, a pro-life event for you to confess your belief that life is a sacred, sacred thing. Check-in begins at 11 a.m. and a rally at 12.30, and then marching from the West End at Planned Parenthood to the Arch in St. Louis. Check out lcms.org slash marchforlife, lcms.org slash marchforlife. Hello, this is Dr. Dale Meyer. Have you heard Concordia Seminary's program, Word and Work and Intersection? Every week, you can hear it on KFUO Thursdays at 2 p.m. Central Time. We visit with many interesting guests about how the Word of God applies to their daily vocations and ministries. Be sure to tune in, and may the intersection of Word and Work be busy on your corner. This week on Issues Etc., we'll discuss the Christian case for Trump with Eric Metaxas. We'll continue our series on the words of Scripture, talking with Pastor Will Whedon about the word peace in the Bible. And we'll get an introduction to the solid declaration of the formula of Concord from Pastor Paul McCain. Issues Etc., live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10 states, if the iron is blunt and not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. Find this true wisdom in Christ on Sharper Iron every weekday morning at 8 a.m. here on Worldwide KFUO. Sharpen the iron of your faith together with two pastors as they take up the sword of the Spirit to proclaim the gifts of Christ crucified and risen for you. Welcome back. Cross the fence. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. We're talking about the last days of Jesus here. And, and, and consider we're, today, we're in the upper room. Jesus has a towel wrapped around him, and he's washing the disciples' feet. I mean, this is utterly stunning. Utterly stunning. And Jesus could stop. I mean, if we just stop there and say, and, and we're looking at what Jesus is doing. He washes his disciples' feet, and we say, this is unbelievable humility. That Jesus would, would humble himself to this point to, to, um, to wash the disciples' feet, and yet, 
And yet Jesus will say, now that's, that's nothing yet. I mean, you want to see humility, just wait. Or just wait for, just wait for a few hours. Just wait till tomorrow. I mean, I'm not going to be wrapped in a towel. I'm not, I'm not going to have apostle toe gunk on my hands. <laughs> I'm going to have, I'm going to have nails. Oh boy. Well, Jesus stands up and, and we'll continue with the text here. Chapter, John chapter 13, verse 12. And when he had washed their feet, he put on his outer garments and resumed his place and said to him, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right. For so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I've given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I sinned receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Not only has Jesus washed the disciples' feet and washed us by his death and resurrection, but he has sent us now out into the world to bless and keep one another, especially the disciples. Now, Jesus keeps bringing up the fact that he's about to be betrayed, which is really inter very interesting. Because he, he knows that the, the disciples, remember, have, you're not going to die. Nothing bad's going to happen. We're going to protect you. We got our swords here. We're ready to fight for you. We'll be doing some ear chopping in just a few hours. Don't worry. You know, the disciples just can't get their head around the fact that it's going to happen. Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to be, he's, he's, he's going to be um, uh, beaten. He's going to suffer. He's going to be jailed. He's, or he's going to be tied up. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be put to death. They just aren't, they cannot get their, their head around that. And so Jesus keeps talking about his betrayal. And he knows it's Judas. And Judas is, the devil's inner Judas we had already. The devil's going to come into him again. He's going to put it into his heart. And finally, he's going to be betrayed and so forth. Now, on the same night, at this, really at the same, in the same room, I was in the place, by the way, that was thought to be the upper room still. It's right above the tomb of King David in Jerusalem. And, and we were singing, I think we were singing John Huss's Lord's Supper hymn. And the guard came and pulled a gun on me and told me, Hey, quiet down. So we finished the stanza and quit. But anyway, we're going to pick it up with the words of institution. So they eat the Passover meal, and then I'm going to I'll pick up the, the thread here from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the testament, which is poured out from it for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it with you, drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, there's a big debate about the timing of this thing. I, I don't know quite how to get into this debate um, about when was the supper instituted in comparison to the Passover. And a lot of the old theologians like to get in and dig into the different cups of the Passover, the bread and all this sort of stuff. I, I think that my basic thought on this is when Jesus says new, that's what he's talking about. This is something that's new. So, so there's a the Passover. That's old. And then you have the new, which is new. I want, to, I want you to note maybe one other little text note on this text, is that almost every modern translation of the Bible, when it's talking about the cup, uses the word covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. 
it, it would be better to have testament. Now, it's the same Greek word for both covenant and testament. Both Greek and Hebrew just have one word, covenant and testament. But in English, we have two different words to refer to two different things. A covenant lasts until the death of the people who made the covenant. And the testament starts at the death of the person who makes the testament, like we talk about a person's last will and testament. And what we notice is that the old covenant is a covenant, the, the covenant that God made with Abraham. Now we presume that that covenant, normally a covenant's with two people, but remember God puts Abraham to sleep so he alone can walk through the animals cut in half, the bowl of fire. So it's a one-sided covenant, which is really unique. And we think, well, that'll last forever because after all, the covenant only ends when the person who made it dies and God can never die, right? But when Jesus dies, the old covenant comes to an end. And when Jesus dies, the New Testament begins. So there's a very, there's a clean cut here between the Passover meal and the, and the Lord's Supper. Although while we make that distinction, we also want to, we want to make sure that Jesus is on purpose, making sure that his death is in conjunction with the Passover. Now, what was the Passover? Remember when the Lord was rescuing the people from Egypt? This is an amazing thing to go look at. The Lord's are res rescuing the people from Egypt. The pharaohs are, ah, now you can't go. Okay, you can go. Now you can't go. Back and forth, blah, blah, blah. And then, so it's back and forth until finally the Lord says, I'm just going to give them the wallop, and it's going to be the death of the firstborn, the tenth plague. But before that happens, the Lord institutes a meal, the Passover meal. He says, you got to eat unleavened bread, you got to take the lamb, you got to put the blood on the doorposts, and as the angel of death comes through, he'll pass over your house. And the Lord says, this will be a memorial for you of what I'm about to accomplish. Now, I, I, what, I, just to see how that goes, because normally you don't celebrate something until after it happens. Can you imagine giving someone the gold medal before they won the race? And yet that's exactly what the Lord does with the Passover meal. He says, you, you, you should celebrate this memorial in celebration of what I'm about to do. And there's a parallel there to the Lord's Supper as well. Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's our Pascha, Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He's the lamb that was sacrificed, and the blood that shed now causes death to pass over us. It's beautiful. John says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So all this stuff is coming together for us in this, in this text, that Jesus is going to provide the sacrificial death so that we can avoid the angel of death. And that he gives us the meal to celebrate that before the event happens. He says, do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of what? Of my death, which haven't, hasn't even happened. How can we remember something that we can't remember, that we can't, that we can't look back on, that's happened already? Now, one other thing, though, and to note, and that is that you would think that if Jesus was... Uh, if you were to guess, remember we play this game and we look at the scriptures, what's going to happen next? And... You would think that if Jesus was instituting something like this, that instead of taking bread, he would have taken some of the lamb. And he would have given him the lamb and said, this is my body. This is, take and eat, this is my body. But he doesn't. He takes the, he takes the blood, or he takes the bread. Take and eat, this is my body. Now there's a lot to get into in the history of the church and the history of theology here, the different views of different churches. We just got to say that, that Jesus said what he meant to say. This is my body. This is the New Testament in my blood. And it's poured out for you. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has a lot more to teach, and I want to pick up with a few uh, lines from John 14. And here again, we're going to skip around what's called sometimes Jesus' farewell discourse or high priestly discourse. One person said that this, John chapter 13 to 17, is the, is the unfolding of the heart of Jesus, and I think that's a nice way to look at it. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth 
and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. It's enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do, not, still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the count of the works themselves. This text is popular from, well, from, I mean, a lot of funerals. It's a beautiful text. I go to prepare a place for you. But, but I want you to imagine it because I used to think, well, I don't, for, for whatever reason, just had this, this picture of, like, Jesus, <laughs> like, adding on a bedroom above the garage. <laughs> like, I, I, you're, you need to make the house bigger, so I'm going to go and make space for you. But the problem in heaven is not that there's, enough, there's not enough space, like there's not enough bedrooms or something like that. That is not the issue. The reason why there's no place for us in heaven is because we're sinners. Right? I mean, the re it's, not, it's, it's not a matter of geography. It's not a matter of space. It's a, it's a matter of sin. And so when Jesus says... Uh, that when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, he's saying, I'm going to make you holy. I'm going to win for you the forgiveness of sins. He, it, when Jesus talks about going to prepare a place, he's not talking about his ascension. He's talking about his crucifixion. Well, he'll continue, and we'll pick up a few verses in John chapter 15. I'm the true vine. My father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Some people think that at this point Jesus has now left the upper room. They sang a hymn and they're on their way, uh, and they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And maybe they passed a arbor with uh, grapes or something, and Jesus stops. And he would he would often do this. I mean, he would take up his preaching from the props that were around him. And so now they're on their way. The sun is set. It's already officially Friday, according to the Jewish reckoning. Remember that the Jewish day starts at sundown. It starts when you can see two stars at a glance in the sky or something like that. I can't remember the official thing, but in the Jewish mind, it's night and then day. So it's not midnight to midnight. It's sundown to sundown. And so the sun has gone down and it's now Friday night. It's Good Friday. And the disciples are on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus says, and now here's chapter 16, I think. Now I am going to him who sent me, verse 5, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I did not go away, the helper will come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. This is a beautiful name for the Holy Spirit, by the way, the helper. In Greek, the parakletos. That means, and it's, it's, it's all the time used in the Bible as a, as a verb. It means to support or encourage or even command or, or whatever. Uh, but... Um, but here is a title. I, I believe it's only used twice in the scriptures. Here as uh, as a title for the Holy Spirit, and then in First John as a title for Jesus. And it means the one who comes alongside you in court to take up your case and to join you in your defense. And Jesus says, I'm going to send you the paraclete, the helper, the comforter, the, the advocate. Then Jesus prays, John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, 
that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus goes on to pray for the world, for the preaching of the gospel, for the church, that it would be one as he and the Father are one. And then he goes on to pray for the disciples and those who would believe through their word. Jesus, it's amazing to think that Jesus there is praying for you and for me, those who believe from, from hearing the words of the disciples. And then they arrive at the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where we'll pick it up after the break. Ugh, another break. We'll go and take a quick, a quick break. You're listening to Cross the Fence, Pastor Brian Wolfman there, and we're meditating on the last days of Jesus. We've gone from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane. We're right on the edge of the garden, and we'll follow Jesus and his disciples into the garden and see what happens there next. Stay with me. Uh, after the short break, we'll be right back. Hi, this is Pastor Mark Azil, the LCMS Director of Campus Ministry and the Chancellor of LCMSU, inviting you to join us right here on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. in the Student Union. If you can't make it, Student Union is always available as a podcast at kfuo.org. Learn more about LCMSU at lcmsu.org. And remember, college is tough. You need Jesus. We'll help. Wednesday afternoon at 2 on KFUO. Did you know that your individual retirement account may make the best gift to KFUO? The IRS now allows individuals 70 and a half or older to transfer their required minimum distribution directly to charity and avoid paying the associated income tax. These gifts can provide regular long-term resources to KFUO. If you have questions about making an IRA gift to KFUO, call me, Mary, at 314-996-1518. We'll send a representative out to help answer your question and help you establish a legacy of being to your favorite radio station, Worldwide KFUO. All right, welcome back to Cross the Fence. God be praised for the life and death of Jesus, which is what we're talking about here. We're talking about the last days of Jesus. We've gone through the washing the disciples' feet in the upper room, the giving of the body and the blood, the New Testament. We, we sang a hymn with the disciples, and we left the upper room. We traveled out of Jerusalem to the east, down to the Kidron Valley. I remember hearing somewhere that, you know, the temple would drain... Um, would drain down into the brook Kidron so that during the Passover week um, there was so much bloodshed from all the lambs that the Kidron Valley was almost flowing with blood. I, I, I don't know if that's true historically, but it's interesting to think about that Jesus and the disciples go down through the brook and come up with bloody feet on the other side. And they go into the Garden of Gethsemane. When you go to the Garden of Gethsemane today, you can find these old, old olive trees. Uh, 2,000, 2,200 year old olive trees. So you think that these trees were there listening to Jesus as he prayed. So they come into the, into this Garden of Gethsemane. It seems like Jesus would often go there with his disciples. It was a favorite place of his. It was out of the bustle of the city. And Jesus was always on retreat to pray. Something we m might ought to remember. And so they, he, so that uh, Jesus takes his disciples over there to the garden, and we'll pick it up with Matthew 26, verse 30, and then verses 36 to 46. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here, watch with me. And going a little farther, a stone's throw, it says in another place, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, I want to note a couple of things about this. this is, you've got to just think it's at nighttime, and they've, and they've gone down the valley. They've come up into the garden. They're, they're there. Jesus has gone off, and he's, and he's 
and he's there with the disciples. He says, you guys sit here, and he takes Peter, James, and John, the three that he took with him up on to the Mount of Transfiguration, These, this kind of his inner circle, and they go a stone distance away, and he says, you also, please pray, pl- please pray with me. And then Jesus goes on from them, and he's by himself over at the distance, and he kneels, he doesn't kneel down, he falls down on his face. Can you imagine Jesus falling down with his face in the in the dirt? <sighs> And he's praying, my father. Now notice that Jesus doesn't, I mean, when he teaches us to pray, he says, pray our father. But here it's not our father, it's it's my father. And why? Jesus is not including us in this prayer. We're not praying this prayer with Jesus to the Father. Jesus alone is praying it to the Father. And why? Because it's concerning the work that he only would do. The cup that he only was going to drink. He prays, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, the list of things that are stunning about this, kind of, or just kind of, the list would go on and on and on. For example... How is it that Jesus does not know if it's possible? He knows all the time that this is the only way for the salvation of the world to be accomplished. And yet remember that the, 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 the personal union of the two natures in Jesus Christ is in such a way that even though he is all-knowing according to his divine nature, that there are things that he cannot know. Not the, the, the time uh, at the end. And that for the purpose of his suffering, we begin to see here in the garden that he's going to hide from himself the things that would give him comfort. Now just think about that. Jesus is, he has to completely trust in God as Father. He has to hand himself over to the will of God. He can't say, I know this is the only way done. No, he says, if there's another way, if there's any other way, let's do that, not this. Now, for us, it's so comforting because we know that there is no other way. There's no other way to be saved. There's no other name given on heaven and on earth by which we must be saved. Save the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. His name and his name alone is our salvation. His name and his, his name alone is our hope for life. His death, his blood, his resurrection, this is it. His cross, there's no other way. This is it. There's no other option. There's no plan B. There's no back door into eternal bliss. If there was another way, if there was another way, then the Father would have answered the prayer of Jesus and given him that way. But there is no other way. My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And we want to ask, what's in the cup? Jesus uses the picture of drinking to describe his arrest, his his affliction, his suffering, his passion, his death. It's a drinking of a cup. And what is it? It's the cup that the prophets talked about, the cup of the wrath of God, the cup of his indignation, the cup of God's anger over our own sinfulness. This is the cup that Jesus is taking. It's, it's, it's your sin and it's my sin that's mixed up there and Jesus is going to be drinking it and drinking it all. All the wrath, all the suffering, all the everything. Jesus is putting it down the hatch so that you don't have to. Hmm. He came, verse 40, he came and found his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me for an hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Isn't that true? Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he again came and found them sleeping, for their eyes was, were heavy. So, so leaving them again, he went and prayed a third time, saying the same words again. Now I want to pick up a couple of verses I've been reading in the Gospel of Matthew. I want to pick up a couple of verses from St. Luke, who says, And be in agony he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And there appeared an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Back to Matthew. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, 
Sleep and take your rest later on. See the hours at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So we have the prayer in the garden. Now, the arrest and trial and crucifixion and burial of Jesus uh, is about to begin. I want to switch from Matthew over to John, John chapter 18, to pick up the story. So you got to see Jesus. I mean, you think that now he's 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 stood up from his prayer. He's got the the dirt from the garden pressed in already to the drops of blood that was falling from his face and. And the disciples are kind of bleary-eyed. They're trying to figure out exactly what's going on. And now, all of a sudden, a mob is going to come from Jerusalem, a kind of pitchforky mob, maybe the soldiers that were allocated to the temple, something like this. And they're going to come, and they're going to be following Judas, who knew the place where Jesus would take the disciples. And Jesus and Judas is going to betray him. Now, I, I used to wonder, why did it take the betrayal of Judas? Why, why didn't they just go and get him? But we want to remember a couple of things. Number one, Jerusalem was not like the felt board Jesus. I mean, it's not like there's three little houses and everything else. I mean, Jerusalem was a big city, tens of the, maybe hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem. And at the Passover, it would swell to a million plus people. I mean, just imagine going to a city with a million people and then trying to just walk and find someone. I mean, it was just, it was full of people, packed full. And second, Jesus wasn't staying in Jerusalem. He was out of town. And so, and third, and this is maybe a key point to remember as we dig into this, that they, they were afraid of arresting Jesus in public. They knew that if they if they arrested him in public, the people would riot. The people, the public, seemed to be on the side of Jesus, so they're trying to catch him by by himself. So Jesus would come into the public places, oftentimes, but he wouldn't. You know, they couldn't do anything there they, because they were afraid. So now Judas, for thirty pieces of silver, is going to lead uh, is going to lead this little little uh, kind of rent a mob to arrest Jesus in the garden. Picking it up in John chapter eighteen. Now Judas, who betrayed him also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. Some translations say I am he. It's just ego a me in the Greek. There's remember there's seven I am statements in in the Gospel of John, like I am the vine, I am the door, I am the good shepherd. But then there's just seven plain old I ams. The divine name. I am. And they drew back and fell to the ground. Can you imagine all these soldiers coming to get Jesus? And there they are. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And poof, they fall over. So then they all scramble and get back up. And come, They're kind of, uh, what's about to happen here? So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he told them, I told you, I am. And nothing happens. In other words, Jesus is saying, <laughs> Jesus is saying, you, I could wipe you guys out if I wanted to, but I am. When he says that second, I told you I am, and they don't fall over, they're looking, they're like, are we safe? Are we going to stand up? Or, and Jesus is saying, okay, you can come and get me. I told you I am. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me. I've lost not one of them. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it. And struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? There's the cup. So the band of soldiers and their captains and their officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And all the disciples left him. And fled. So Jesus, bound in ropes, 
being led to the to the house of Caiaphas, Annas first and then Caiaphas. The disciples fled into the night and the sham trial of Jesus about to begin. We'll stop there and we'll pick it up next week. This is Cross the Fence. I'm, I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. We're talking about the last days of Jesus and what they mean for us. The, the last moments of the life of Jesus and what they mean for our life. Th this is our hope and our peace. That hidden beneath the humility of Jesus with his blood and his sweat and his tears and his prayers and his suffering and the ropes that bound him and the nails that put him on the cross, hidden beneath these things is the glory of God who comes to save us. This Jesus who, who took off his robe to put on a towel and wash the disciples' feet is the same Jesus that comes to us. to cleanse us with his word, to graft us into his life, to forgive all of our sins, to make a way for us, like he said, to live in the Father's house so that where he is, we will be also. Ah, this is the hope in which we live and we die. And hey, thanks for listening to Cross the Fence. We'll catch up with you again next week. God's peace be with you. Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org. Thanks for downloading the Cross Defense podcast. God be praised for all that Jesus has done for us. Hey, if you enjoyed this, I hope that you'll think of someone else that might have enjoyed this meditation on the suffering of Jesus. You could pass it on to them. Share it with them. That's the best way to get the word out of the things that are happening. And also, there's a lot more theology at the website, wolfmuller.co. It's W-O-L-F-M-U-E-L-L-E-R dot C-O, including Wednesday Whatnot. I send out a free little theological newsletter every Wednesday-ish. You can sign up to get that and keep up with the latest stuff. There's videos and all sorts of other stuff over there and a way to contact me. I'd love to hear from you. If you've got questions or thoughts or anything on your mind, uh, please feel free to reach out to me there. Again, it's wolfmuller.co. And thanks again for being a cross-defense listener. God's peace be with you.